Okay. Uh, I am uh, S.A. Park uh, from AMC, so Korea. So I'm really happy with you all in TCTAP workshop, virtual so value session. So, so I uh, introduced Alan Young, he's my co-moderator, and many, uh, you know, excellent panelists, Dr. Papad, Dr. Hashta, Dr. Gang, Dr. Wang, and Dr. Wojakowski. So, all right. So, Alan, would you introduce the speakers we need? Yes, great, uh, SJ. Thank you, and a pleasure to be here. Um, the first half of the session is going to be uh, grouped towards what, what we call what you have to know for, for, for perfect TABR. And our first speaker is uh, Raj Makar. He's going to talk about TABR for bicuspid aortic valve stenosis uh, changes in practice. Hello, everyone. I want to wish everyone uh, good health um, as we hopefully get out of this uh, pandemic. And I want to thank the course directors for inviting me to talk about TAVR in bicuspid aortic stenosis. These are my disclosures. <clears throat> I wanted to start off with this slide, um, which is a four dimensional CT um, of a number of different bicuspid aortic valves, uh, you know, in an effort to make a point that bicuspid aortic stenosis is very heterogeneous. It is not one anatomic uh, uh, morphology. And what matters to TAVR implanter is not just the number of uh, cusps, but also the number of commissures, in fact. And the degree of calcification, the presence of RAFE, especially if they are calcified, and correct sizing, which depends on um, you know, all of the features that are actually mentioned above in an effort to minimize aortic root injury and perivalvular aortic regurgitation. So, this particular uh, study, which is a very old study, uh, basically makes the point that the prevalence of bicuspid valve in patients undergoing isolated AVR is quite substantial. Indeed, in this particular series, almost 50%. And as is also shown here in the same study, that especially in the young patients, uh, in fact, the number of patients having bicuspid aortic stenosis was even higher. Almost two thirds of the patients actually had bicuspid aortic stenosis. Yet, if you look at the registries of TAVR, such as the TVT registry in the United States, um, and, and this is data from a couple of years ago, the number of patients who have bicuspid aortic stenosis and are undergoing TAVR in the TBT registry was only three to 7%. So I think it is important to make the point that TAVR is being used selectively in bicuspid aortic stenosis and hence the data should be interpreted accordingly. So I just thought that I would start off by sharing some case examples, all right? In my cath lab in our program, and here is a 64 year old patient with severe symptomatic uh, bicuspid AS. And if you look at this particular patient, you can see that the left main height is only 7.9. So clearly, if you were to do a TAVR, uh, you would clearly impact the ostium of the left main coronary artery. So in this particular case, we decided to send this patient for surgery. Here is another patient. He's a physician. He's 53 years old and his aortic valve area is 0.8 by cuspid AS, but look at the distribution of calcium just in one commissure. Um, and more importantly, if you look at his aorta, it was more than 4.5. I think all things put collectively, we thought it was not unreasonable for him to have aortic surgery first. And I think he would get a very large valve because his area is 669. And I think that would make him very amenable and very favorable for future taver in taver and maybe two more tavers, you know, um, you know in, 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 in the surgical bioprosthetic valve. So this is another uh, patient that was sent for surgery. Now, here is a patient where the, um, the coronary height is not uh, you know, the, the left main coronary height is still nine, but the sinuses are large. He's 80 years old. Uh, there are calcified uh, raffae on essentially, it seems like on both sides, but there's not a lot of calcium. 
you know, you also had a very um, horizontal aorta. And despite that, we actually did a taber on him and we got a very nice result. There was no residual uh, leakage here. This is the final result with no PV leak, no, not, no significant gradient. Here's a patient who's another patient. And, you know, um, he's 65, uh, but he's got a number of uh, issues, uh, comorbidities. Uh, but look at this. The, uh, the height of the corner is, is substantial, almost 24. And the uh, annular size is 597. So essentially, we thought he can get a large valve. And not only that, but he can get taver in taver and maybe another taver because the coronaries are really high. So despite the presence of LV OT calcium a little bit. All right, we, you know, given the comorbidities, we went ahead and we did a TAVR procedure, as you can see here. Um, you know, we put a 26 millimeter valve, um, post dilated that. This is what, uh, you know, his uh, final echo looked like, not much PV leak, and he went home the next day. Now, here is a patient who's 69, but once again, the coronaries are low. Uh, but the sinuses are huge, in fact, as you can see. And this is a patient who truly did not want um, open uh, surgery. So we went ahead. Uh, we said we would protect the left main, though we knew that it is unlikely to, uh, to be, uh, uh, you know, stented. But nonetheless, we did so. Uh, you can see that there is no, the, the stent frame is far away, in fact, from the ostium of the left main coronary artery. And uh, we didn't have to put any stents. Uh, and this is the final result, trivial paravalvular leak and good outcome. So I, I wanted to give you a flavor of what is happening in our in our lab. So, but where is the data? So this is one of the uh, experiences that we published a couple of years ago from the TVT registry. And essentially what we showed was that, you know, in 2,700 plus patients with bicuspid AS with mean age of 74 and STS of 4.9. So this is prior to the approval of low risk. All right. So these are intermediate risk and high risk patients in a propensity matched fashion. If you look at the, um, the outcomes, they're not bad. Device success was high. Yes, the aortic root injury was a little bit higher compared to tricuspid aortic stenosis, but still less than 1%. And the need for coronary obstruction and need for second valve was also actually low. So if you look at 30-day outcomes, the mortality was similar at 2.6%, but nonetheless, in bicuspid AS patients, the stroke rates were a little bit higher, 2.4% compared to 1.6% um, at 30 days. The pacemaker rates were also a little bit higher, 9.1 compared to 7.5%. One-year mortality was similar between bicuspid and tricuspid patients and very similar to what you would actually expect in these patients. One-year stroke was also not significantly different. Uh, the PV leak was not different, but I have to warn you, by, in my experience, it is a little bit higher. I think it is better now with the uh, Sapien Ultra, which I think has made a further impact uh, because of a higher skirt. But, you know, at least here in a non-core lab adjudicated fashion, it did not seem to be higher compared to tricuspid. And these numbers are actually pretty low. So if you look at the numbers for moderate, they're they are actually, uh, you know, 3%. And the gradients were not different and the aortic valve areas were actually not different, you know. So I think that's good. I think the devil is in the detail when it comes to bicuspid uh, aortic stenosis and TAVR. And as I mentioned earlier, that it is all about the anatomy. And um, <clears throat> my uh, associate, Dr. Sanghan Yoon, put together this uh, experience from uh, um, a number of different sites across the globe, more than a thousand patients who underwent uh, TAVR procedures. We analyzed their CTs. Um, and essentially what you can see is that in this, in this uh, particular um, um, uh, analysis where uh, 10% of the patients were actually uh, type zero. And uh, if you look at uh, the rest of the patients, they were type one and half of these type ones had calcified Rafe, the other, one, the other half did not. And most of the experience was with the, the Sapien three valve, the 30 day mortality was 2% and stroke rate was 2.4%. So actually acceptable. So these are, these are the different uh, phenotypes that we are talking about. And I think what is important is, um, and I can skip this, but these are the numbers. Once again, what the, what you're showing, uh, what we're showing here is that 
when you have a combination of calcified raphate plus excess leaflet calcium, there is a greater incidence of bad things happening, whether it is aortic root injury or whether it is uh, more than a mild PV leak. And if you look at, you know, this thing graphically, and if you look at death from any cause, all right, and if you look at these three different morphologic groups, the, the outcomes are the worst when you have both and the outcomes are the best when you have, uh, you know, none of these uh, 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 present, no calcified raphe and no excess calcium. So at least in this um, data set, and it, you know, there was a f of course referral bias, 26% of the patients were in fact unfavorable, all right? So they had a combination of both excess leaflet calcium and calcified raphe. Um, you know, what that number is, is it 25% or much more? Uh, you know, when you, when you would start looking at low-risk patients remains to be seen. So what do you do when you actually have these patients with adverse characteristics? You know, occasionally these patients are very high risk for surgery and you have no choice. And here is one such case, you know, you, you can see a calcified raphe. There's a lot of calcium. We, you know, this was not a surgical candidate. And nonetheless, we went ahead and did a TAVR. But as you will see, you know, we were careful. So you deploy a valve here. This is, uh, you know, 26 millimeter valve, but we took some volume out because we were concerned about aortic root injury. And then we went ahead, you can see the recoil actually that occurs. And then we go ahead and actually post dial it again to get some uh, uh, recoil out. So this is the, the final result. The valve is still not completely expanded, but it does the job. You know, there is no gradient and there is no leakage. So, you know, what the long-term consequences of somewhat underdeployed valve, we could have also probably argued in favor of using a 23 with excess volume, but at, at times uh, the paravalvular leak may be substantial. So I think you have to be careful. So here is, this is what it looks like. As you can see, it looks pretty good on post haver TE. So there are other data, you know, um, very quickly, you know, these are, this are data from the partner registries from 30 centers, um, you know, some of the key exclusion criteria uh, are listed uh, there, spe specifically hostile anatomy and aortic dimensions more than 40. What is important to uh, notice here is that almost one third, more than one third of the patients were actually excluded from these registries. So there are two registries, the registry and the continued access program. The average age is like 68 or 71. Uh, most of these procedures, two thirds of this procedure were done with conscious sedation, which is remarkable. Uh, and if you look at in hospital death, it was 0%. Valve embolization, 0%. I think these are remarkable results. And aortic rupture, 0%. So careful selection here. Uh, resulted in uh, superb outcomes. And if you look at one year, uh, you know, the, there was only 1.4% death rate, uh, you know, in one of the CAP registry, the, and the other one was 0%. So this is truly remarkable results, but cannot be generalized to all bicuspid patients. So here is the paravalvular regurgitation, you know, mild PVL was present in quarter of patients, but this is, you know, with the Sapien 3, not the Sapien Ultra. I think similarly, good data are present with the uh, Evolute Low Risk Study as well, 222 patients. Some of the exclusions are listed there. Uh, most of these were type 1 bicuspids. And if you look at the, once again, the average age here was 70 years. And if you look at the all-cause mortality or disabling stroke, remarkable, right? 1.3%. All-cause mortality at 30 days, 0.7%. Annual rupture, 0%. So I think the pacemaker rates were a little bit higher compared to the balloon expandable, but I think the theme is beginning to emerge that we can do uh, TAVR with both balloon expandable and self-expanding valves in patients with bicuspid aortic stenosis, and these are the valve areas, and this is the aortic regurgitation. Mild PVL was more prevalent a year, you know, 42%. So I think we need to improve that, especially when it comes to younger patients. So what are some of the practical considerations? I think we have to be careful of unfavorable uh, anatomy, you know, excessive calcium, uh, raphe, especially calcified raphe. Some degree of undersizing is appropriate. Positioning is harder, harder than tricuspid. Well, we tend to do our bicuspids with TE. Uh, 
especially I think as you do younger patients, I think it's reasonable to do that. Um, uh, Predilatation is good. Uh, I think it avoids difficult crossings and I think it can also help with, with sizing. So um, uh, post dilatation and rarely valve in valve may be needed, but I think that is becoming less frequent. So in summary, Favorable outcomes with TAVR in carefully selected patients with Sapien and Evolute in real life TVT and sponsored uh, uh, prospective registries are now beginning to emerge. CT phenotyping is important in patient selection and procedure planning. While bicuspid TAVR is justifiable in intermediate and high risk patients, I think with, with low risk patients, we've got to be careful, especially when there is aortopathy and when there is uh, adverse uh, phenotypic features. And I think what we need is really randomized clinical trials and prospective registries with long-term follow-up. So I will go ahead and end my talk uh, at this point. Thank you. So thank you, um, Raj, for the excellent talk. We're going to move on to the next uh, speaker. Um, and it's going to be uh, someone that we don't have to introduce uh, since everybody know Eberhard Grube so well. And he's going to talk about minimizing embolic event during TAVR best in 2021. Eberhard? Okay, so SJ and Alan, thank you so very much um, again to be part of TCTAP 2021. Unfortunately, still virtual, and the topic of my talk is minimizing embolic events, the latest Tavra data 2021. Um, this is my disclosure. And post Tavra stroke leads to poor outcomes for patients and their families. Although rates are low, Reducing the risk of stroke remains an important concern for the future of the therapy. post heavy stroke is associated with increased in hospital and 30-day mortality, decreased neurocognitive function, decreased discharge home post heavy, and impaired social and recreational activities. The stroke incidents are shown here. The U.S. registry reports about 2% stroke rate and this is a decrease slightly over the time from 2.8 to 2.3 in, in 2019. This likely reflects changing the patient demographics towards lower risk, an increased operator experience, as well as refined procedural techniques. The incidence of stroke, the timing after TAVA, the greatest risk of stroke, is in the immediate post tavi period. In an analysis of over 100,000 TAVI patients, the median time to stroke was two days. Then risk factors. Baseline calcium volume obviously is a risk factor. Increased microemboli released during TAVI in heavily calcified valves is obvious. However, calcium is not the only material debris that embolizes during a TAVI procedure. Debris beyond calcium is shown here, native aortic wall, valve tissue, thrombus, polymer debris from catheters, and some and many more. Microemboli can be detected at all stages of the TAVI procedure. Here you show instrumentation, valvuloplasty deployment, and post-implantation. The top procedural steps, however, are valve positioning, crossing the valve, or exchanging catheters. You must, we must prioritize patient outcomes over microembolic risk. Obviously, proper positioning and use of post dilatation have to be prioritized over silent microemboli. We have to keep the patient in focus. Valve design and features could, could be in order to prevent stroke. The only randomized trial Today, comparing contemporary balloon and self-expanding valves, the, uh, the sole TAVI demonstrated a significantly lower rate of stroke in the self-expanding evolute cohort, but this can be due to a lower um, operator experience using balloon expandable valves, as shown here between evolute R and Sapien 3. The um, recapturability also might be a risk factor for stroke. <clears throat> we see here some of those devices, however, Recapturability is not associated with increased risk of stroke. Shown here, self-expanding recapture 2%, self-expanding no recapture 0.7%, and balloon expandable 2%, no difference. Stroke prevention, obviously, 
and body protection devices come into the game set. Most use Claret Medical Sentinel and Keystone TriGuard. The REFLECT study, however, showed no, no uh, similar rates for in-hospital stroke and 30-day stroke um, using the, this, this device as shown by, the TC, by Dr. Moses at TCT 2020, no difference in hospital 30-day mortality. The central device also um, is shown here with the, met the safety endpoint and demonstrated a lower total volume of brain lesions compared to TAVI without protection. If you look at the uh, stroke rate, you can see on the left side, uh, there's a difference between with and without Sentinel. On the right side, you can see uh, the, uh, the day three days of stroke, and you see a reduction of stroke uh, from 8.2 to 3.0, but that was not so uh, um, statistically significant. A large study from the US TBT registry analyzing 130,000 plus patients showed no difference in stroke between those patients using SEP and those who did not. Well, then there might be a group of patients where we can use SEP selectively. And those patients might include bicuspidiotic valve, valve and valve procedures, highly calcified valves or aortic, and patients with history of stroke. There is a need, obviously, for a large randomized study on SEP. This is the protected TAR trial, randomized prospectus trial, including 3,000 patients. And the primary completion will be in June 2022. Many of the, que of the questions that are still remaining probably will be answered by this study. There's also a need for further study on silent brain lesions and long-term cognitive impact by diffusion-weighted MRI, by hits detected by transcranial Doppler, and by the analysis of debris volume. Of course, antithrombotic regimen, very important. Another key piece of maintaining a low risk group. The current European Society of Cardiology and US guidelines last updated 2017, recommend dual antiplatelet therapy for the first three to six months post TAVI or single antiplatelet therapy in patients at high risk of bleeding as class 2B recommendation. Recently, the US updated their uh, antithrombotic guidelines and they recommend single antiplatelet therapy as a class 2A level of incidence, demonstrating because uh, these single antiplatelet therapy demonstrated similar efficacy uh, compared to DAPT and reduces the risk of major bleeding events. Obviously, the key balancing act for the post tabby antithrombotic regimen is to mitigate risk of thrombotic uh, events and valve thrombosis without introducing elevated bleeding risk. There are several studies ongoing that aim to further define proper antithrombotic strategies for TAVI patients. And then, of course, subclinical thrombosis or HOD. The HOD uh, sub-studies conducted within the randomized part of three and absolute low-risk trials included prospective CT follow-up at 30 days in one year did not show an association between HALT and increased stroke and TIA events. We also have to realize that HALT or subclinical thrombosis is a very dynamic phenomenon. HALT can resolve spontaneously and may appear one year after TAVI or later. Then finally, summarizing the evidence. Rates of stroke have declined slightly over the past five years but stroke prevention remains an important area for improving patient outcomes post-TAVI. Most TAVI-related strokes occur within the first few days after the procedure, affecting approximately 2% of patients. Subclinical ischemic lesions occur at all stages of the TAVI procedure, but the clinical impact long-term and the long-term prognosis of these silent infarcts are still unknown. Embolic protection devices are being studied for reducing risk of stroke and can be considered safe in TAVI patients. They might be used in a certain subset of patients. And then finally, optimal antithrombotic regimen and the significance of fault and subclinical leaflet thrombosis are still undefined 
and need to be resolved. With that, SJ and Alan, I would like to thank all of you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Eberhard. Um, we'll come back for discussion uh, after our uh, next lecture. So the next uh, talk will be given by uh, Danny Devere. He's going to talk about PCI before and after TAVR uh, updated strategy and technology. Um, Danny? So happy to be here and thank you for the kind invitation. Here are my disclosures. So we're going to talk about uh, the issue of coronary disease and the TAVR procedures and Many of our patients, since uh, TAVR procedures are performed in patients that are relatively old on average, then coronary disease is, re is relatively prevalent. We see that uh, approximately 50% of patients coming for TAVR procedures have some kind of coronary artery disease. In some of the studies, it also reached uh, 75%. It's a relatively common combination to have aortic stenosis and coronary disease and uh, we need to think about it when we approach our patients, whether we need to do the PCI before, during, or after, and how to do the PCI in patients having TAVR procedures. Fortunately, we have now a large registry is describing the uh, epidemiology of patients coming for PCI procedures after a, a TAVR, after a surgical AVR, and in the Surtavi study, we see that not many patients after valve replacement eventually went to PCI, only 2.2%. The duration of time between the indexed AVR and the PCI varied significantly, but on average in this data collection, it was approximately two years. And again, relatively uncommon, but maybe this is because the follow-up is still not very long. We talk about patients coming for PCI after TAVR procedures. We see that fortunately, the majority, the vast majority of them come in stable condition. These are patients with stable angina coming for a PCI, and the minority have acute coronary syndrome. Between these cases, very few cases come with STEMI. This is the I think the most feared uh, situation that a patient after a TAVR procedure would come with STEMI to a center that doesn't really know or understand the, the frame of the TAVR device or how to cannulate the coronary artery and may uh, find a significant challenge of a, a opening that occluded vessel. But I'll describe later on, on a, best access, optimal strategy on how to mitigate these issues. When we talk about coronary access after TAVR procedures, fortunately, uh, the success rate is high. It's not that we cannot do PCI after TAVR procedures. We do see that there are some failed cases, but in the majority of cases in large registries, we see that above 90% usually have success rate in cannulating the coronary arteries and performing PCI. When we talk about PCI after TAVR procedures, we need to understand that the TAVR devices, the THV devices are very different, right? There are many, many different frames and the, uh, how their commissures look like, uh, they differ significantly. And uh, we need to understand the device uh, very, very well to, to cannulate the coronaries. And I think that the most important lesson for a center that doesn't do TAVR and uh, they find themselves uh, with a need to do a PCI on a stable patient is to have a good advice from someone that does know what, are, what is the device that is now in the aortic root. We also need to understand that in the majority of these uh, implants, the devices have a waist that is relatively narrow. This is uh, uh, very common in tower devices to uh, have a waist that this is like in Evolute, Evolute 23 has a waist of only 20 millimeters, right? So we reconstruct the aortic root after tower and now having a JL4 EBU35 will not uh, work conventionally. We commonly need to undersize significantly 
the catheter that now will approach the left coronary, for instance. We also need to understand that there is a skirt, the uh, devices, the uh, guide, the diagnostic catheter will not be able to cannulate the coronaries through the skirt or through the commissures of the device. They are covered, there is no ability to, to go through them. And you do not want to go through them, it may damage the entire device. So these are the uh, basic uh, anatomical considerations when we cannulate the coronaries after a tower device. We need to understand the frame and the places where we can go through the frame in order to cannulate the coronaries. What makes the situation more complex is that in many of the cases that come for PCI after tower procedures, the alignment of the commissures are suboptimal. You can find yourself with a commissure of the tower device just in front of the coronary artery that may make the cannulation more difficult, but I'll describe later on how to mitigate that issue. Well, all commercial tower frames may extend above the left coronary ostium. Obviously, shorter frames less commonly will extend above uh, uh, the coronary ostia. Uh, we do not have in clinical practice the, sepin, the old sepin or sepin XT, and when they were historically implanted low, they very, uh, it was not common to have them in, in, uh, above the level of the coronary ostia. But also sepin 3 in uh, many of the cases the frame of the sepin 3 can go above the level of the, the coronary and surely all the cases with the uh, evolute, with accurate, with the uh, uh, portico will go above the level of the coronary. Also that you need to go through the frame of the device in order to cannulate. When we talk about the equipment list for post-TAVI coronary access, this is not something uh, very unusual or something that you do not have on, uh, uh, in, in almost all of the cat lab uh, uh, places. Basically, you want to se uh, select for the left system a, a passive guide catheter. Like I said, it's better to use a JL than an EBU or XB, and undersizing that catheter is many times uh, very helpful. Guide extensions are also very important in order to give you some support, especially when uh, the guide uh, doesn't go through the frame of the device and is sitting just behind. The most important thing for me before performing a post avi coronary access is to review the last shot of the aortogram at the end of the other procedures that was performed before. So I look at the autogram and try to understand what is the relationship between the coronary ostia and the frame of the device. Sometimes then when we talk about evolute and all the uh, core valves, there is a gap, not in this particular case, but uh, there could be a gap between the device and the wall of the aorta that you can sneak a catheter uh, uh, between the two and it gives you actually very good support. So the baseline aortogram is very important. If you do not have uh, that aortogram, I suggest uh, performing an aortogram as the first uh, step before cannulating the coronary arteries. The cannulation of the coronary arteries uh, should be relatively passive. And one of the important things to understand is that we can, and there are cases, we can damage the tower device by uh, pressing on the leaflets. And if we are too aggressive, we can lead to permanent intravalvular uh, aortic regurgitation. So that procedure should be performed very carefully. And if coronary engagement is unsuccessful, we shouldn't uh, be sticked with the same equipment. We should probably try different uh, guide catheter size or kind. And uh, the important thing is to target an adjacent cell. So we talked about the commissures in Evoluto Koval, for instance, that uh, they are very high. We are not able to go through them. So we need to try to go to the coronary uh, a bit uh, anterior or a bit posterior to the cell that we tried before. And obviously you can uh, wire 
the coronary uh, by air mailing or without really sitting inside the coronary and later on to deliver a guide extension and then deliver all the equipment through that uh, path. Maybe I'll not uh, describe in long, uh, but there, there are many bench testing that I uh, worked closely with Medtronic on that topic of uh, uh, coronary access after tower procedures, but uh, it goes through the same concepts that I described before, trying to use a passive equipment and uh, trying to undersize the guide catheter before the procedure. When performing the intervention, <clears throat> It's important to use a support uh, uh, catheter. And uh, sometimes I, in my procedures, after I sneak a wire in and I do not have good support, I consider using a micro catheter going inside the coronary and exchanging the wire that enabled me to go to the, uh, to the coronary tree to use a more uh, supportive wire like uh, uh, many different kinds that you can use in order to have better support delivering the balloons and the stents. And uh, if there is uh, some obstruction in the inflow to the coronary, like we have sometimes in uh, tower procedures, we obviously need to do snorkeling technique and have a stent delivered and uh, deployed in the ostium of the left main or the RCA going a little bit uh, towards the uh, STJ. At the end of the procedure, one of the important things to do is uh, uh, to remove very carefully the guide catheter. There were cases, not many that I know of, uh, fortunately I didn't have a case like that, that the guide catheter was pulled and pulled the device with it. So the important thing is to keep a wire in the coronary tree or sometimes you want to bring an O35 uh, wire to give you some support and only then to remove the catheter and be very careful not to uh, withdraw the tower device. The issue of commissural alignment is uh, beyond, beyond the scope of uh, my presentation, but obviously commissural alignment of tower procedures should be part of optimal tower procedures now in 2021. We need to, to be very meticulous about how we deploy our devices, not only in the depth and to choose uh, the, size, the correct sizing of these devices, but also to understand in the short axis how the commissures of the new device will interact with the anatomy. We do not want the commissures of our new tower device to be in front of the coronary arteries. So just uh, before I, I'm going to finish a couple of tips for diagnostic uh, procedure PCIs to select a tower device that we may enable reasonable coronary access later on. There are devices, tower devices that will enable easier PCI later on. So maybe in selected patients, you may want to, perf to select these devices and not others. You want to perform commissural alignment during your deployment of the tower device. If it is an elective procedure, consider getting coronary CTA before doing the procedure. You need to understand well the characteristics of the tower device, to understand well the patient anatomy, to start with the aortogram or to review the post-tower aortogram. You want to use smaller passive cannulation catheters, consider multipurpose or IM for the RCA. I usually start with the multipurpose for the RCA. Use a J-wire to help you get to the desired frame diamond from with the catheter. Consider using guideliner for PCI because we need the better support. Consider using free coronary wiring without guide engagement, changing guide catheters or targeting different uh, cells. We should not fear paravalvular leak that is seen commonly in these situations in guide injections because we are behind, behind the, the frame of the device. And in many of these cases, the PVA looks awful, but actually is not very significant. And we need to be careful not to damage the tower device. And obviously we need to remove the catheter over a wire very carefully. Here I'll show you very few examples. Here is air mailing or wiring the coronaries without an, a real engagement of the coronary ostium with the device. And later on, you can bring equipment over that wire and uh, uh, bring a guide extension 
and you have better support to do the procedure. And uh, here is an example of a multi-vessel PCI that I performed. Uh, here is the uh, coronary ostia engagement led by the O35 wire, and later on the engagement. And that patient uh, had rotablation of the mid LAD. And later on, uh, LAD was opened well. And then I went to to the PCI to the right coronary artery. In that case, the RCA engagement was performed behind the frame of the core valve device. Later on, PCI of the right coronary artery was done without an issue. Here's an example of a inferior STEMI that uh, we had in my center uh, relatively recently, and the, the operator that was on call was not able to deliver equipment to open that right coronary artery. And actually, the, the only thing that I changed later on doing that procedure is bringing the guide liner well into the vessel before trying to open that vessel. And uh, actually, there was no issue in doing that procedure. Here's an example of a left main PCI that I had before bifurcation lesion. Engagement of the left main was not very complex with the JL guide catheter. And later on, was able to do a, a culotte, I believe, in that case. And the left main was opened well. It was actually a DK crash, I think. And this is, a, uh, as I said, uh, the most feared uh, situation after tower procedure. That was a patient that came with anterior STEMI after tower with occlusion of the distal left main that uh, uh, fortunately was able to uh, open that vessel well. And uh, the coronary tree was salvaged. So I'd like to summarize that the clinical studies show that coronary access after TAVI is technically feasible and have been reported uh, with the positive outcomes. And we can say that more than 90% of uh, uh, post tower PCI procedures are successful. And so it's not impossible, or in many cases, it's very easy to do PCI after tower. Access can be achieved using standard tools and the approaches with minor modifications, but there are numerous tips and tricks on how to perform well post avi coronary access. And uh, maybe the most important tip would be to ask for help from a, a person that knows these devices well. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Danny. Um, so we have about um, 10 minutes or so for discussion and uh, maybe you can start with uh, Eberhardt in terms of um, you know cerebral protection. So, so Eberhardt in 2021, uh, what is your practice now? Do you protect everyone or use your selective pro protection algorithm? Um, maybe you can discuss sort of is there a change from the you know, last few years or pretty much you continue the same same sort of uh, uh, plan? Well, I mean I. You know my my point of view for for many years on that. If we focus on the patient, then I, I would uh, in every patient because we do know how I, you know we do know that there is a certain risk group uh, that might speak uh, more for us uh, and some less. But since we don't know, you know, don't have any clear guide as to when to use or not to use, I would use it on all. I realize though that the data situation is inconclusive. Um, we see this, we see that, uh, we have conflicting results. However, I would also um, indicate that using the TriGuard device, you know, now these, these, these um, um, data come out using different devices and, and we know there are different efficacies on different devices. So there's a lot of confusion at this point. And the TBT registry that was reported by David uh, also showed no difference between SEP with SEP and without SEP. So 
I think at the end of the day, it depends on, um, on, on many issues. Number one, how you personally feel about it. Uh, number two, the reimbursement issues, obviously, in Europe are very important, play a very important role. <clears throat> and, uh, and then probably we have to wait uh, until the TAVR, um, the, uh, the Protect TAVR data come out. But that will be only the next year. So what are we going to do in the remaining months? My, my point is I would use it unless we know better. Certainly in the bicuspids, heavily calcified and valve and valve procedures. Um, and also um, obviously in patients with a history of stroke or any other risk factor. Um, maybe I can ask uh, Samir, welcome. Um, any change in your strategy at, at, at Cleveland still uh, protect everyone or you have uh, 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 taken a different approach? No, thank you, first of all, uh, for, the, for the question. No, actually, we are using it in all the patients, uh, all alternative access, all the patients uh, with the uh, with transfemoral. And uh, if you are going to do the subclavian, we try to do it on the left subclavian so that we can use from the right subclavian, right uh, radial, the, femoral, uh, the, uh, the sentinel device. I think personally, of course, I'm biased. We are looking forward to the protected tower trial. Uh, we are enrolling well. Uh, so maybe we can uh, beat the deadline, uh, but it is uh, because it's a simple trial, 72 hours uh, endpoint. Uh, so hopefully uh, we should be able to get good data uh, pretty soon. Hey, can I have a question, uh, Alan, to, to Samir and the rest of you? Suppose yeah. the study is negative. Suppose the study is negative. Would you change your mind protecting the patient? That is, yeah, it has crossed uh, many times my mind that uh, what if the study shows uh, no difference. But study is designed with the, with the intention of uh, doing the event-based uh, analysis in the sense that if our, our initial hypothesis of the events is less, then we will increase the sample size. Uh, with this study of this magnitude, this size, even if the entire study is negative, we should be able to find uh, some idea that in which population uh, it is helpful. So uh, yeah. even, though, even though the entire primary endpoint may be negative, uh, we may be able to find the high-risk patients. So this may at least guide us uh, to say that which patient population. We have a lot of different secondary endpoints. So all of those things I think are, are important to keep in mind because the, the data are going to be incredible because this is going to be 3,000, 2,500 to 3,000 patients. Um, Samir, do you have any pre-specified um, uh, groups of patients you're gonna look into high risk versus, you know, so that you have pre some predetermined secondary endpoints? Correct, so we are looking at uh, everything that you just mentioned that valve in valve, bicuspid valve, uh, heavily calcified valve, high risk versus low risk patients, or high risk versus intermediate risk patients. So there is a there is and uh, you know we may even look at the different valves. So there is there are all kinds of uh, uh, endpoints that pre-specified uh, endpoints that we are uh, or subgroups that we are planning to look at. Uh, any other panelists uh, want to comment about uh, cerebral protection? I think the the overall question is how to reduce stroke. And as Everard mentioned, that sentinel or cerebral protection will take care of stroke risk during the procedure. The question also is how do we reduce the risk after the procedure? And the question of halt always comes in my mind. Uh, is there any move towards three months of anticoagulation? As we reduce, you know, the risk of, you know, patients, low risk patients can tolerate three months anticoagulation and maybe so we are looking at uh, something like that in our center in terms of should we do a CT guided anticoagulation strategy as well and see the impact on stroke, which we see in some patients much later. I think that one of the things to remember is that stroke is relatively rare situation. We're happy that it's not very common. We're sad when it happens, but it's relatively rare. But cognitive decline 
is more common. And maybe the end point shouldn't be something very uh, severe but rare, but something more soft that we see from time to time, cognitive decline after a tarver procedure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did, right? Uh, as you <clears throat> know that the indications, uh, guideline is to be a little bit more getting younger patients. And so I uh, would be really concerned uh, about, uh, you know, just uh, uh, Danny mentioned about uh, cognitive dysfunction in the 65 patients uh, receive some unrecognized, you know, microemboli, something like that. They would have uh, some clinical, you know, uh, relevance in the later, and so we have to uh, see that. All right, I, I got a, a, a question uh, to the Danny, the DBR. So in terms of the patients, uh, you know, uh, every uh, cirrhosis patient had a lot of, uh, you know, concomitant coronary artery disease. And so you do, uh, at the beginning of a procedure, do PCI first and TABOR, and Table first, then PCI first. Just a simple question. To be honest, it's it's a very very complex uh, uh, scenario. Uh, the combination of coronary disease and aortic stenosis in a patient coming. There are so many different uh, scenarios. There are these patients that have angina before the tarver. They have aortic stenosis and angina, and they have a significant uh, narrowing of one of their coronary arteries. And sometimes we don't know. So if the AS is not critical and the mid LAD is critically narrowed, then you think maybe it's important to treat that vessel before. And uh, But if the AS is critical and the narrowing is in a part that doesn't look uh, so important for a patient, it's a mid-distal circumflex, maybe we leave that alone and just see how the patient manages later on. Uh, so it's really a clinical decision. What is the culprit for the patient's symptoms? I, uh, in, in the past, like many of my colleagues, uh, used to treat these uh, coronary arteries, uh, uh, like treat everything before the tower procedures. And now we just uh, review in the CT that the patients have before the tower procedure, whether they have some proximal lesion, left main lesion, if they don't have, we just do the tarver procedure. Okay, so a practical concern. Uh, could you tell us some uh, any difference in terms of accessibility after the balloon expandable and coval as evolute R after the procedures? Which one would be more accessible? Well, obviously, we have now data to support uh, the notion that uh, short tarver device frames and uh, especially those that do not have supraannular morphology for the leaflets, they don't have tall commissures that you cannot engage the coronaries through them, uh, are, uh, are better. Uh, Sepin, old Sepin and Sepin XTs were perfect for going uh, back to the coronaries. They are not with us anymore. And it seems that it's uh, probably more challenging with the long frame supraannular tower devices that uh, are in clinical practice. But uh, I do believe that in almost all of the cases, and also CTO procedures that need a lot of support, we are able to do PCI after TAVA procedures. And uh, we just need to understand the new concepts around these procedures and uh, not uh, do the routine uh, practice that we do in conventional cases. Hi, Jan Amon. OK, good to see you. Hi. Was a comment or something? Hi, Danny. Uh, anybody right. have a question? A further question, uh, Doctor Wojciechowski? Well, did you have a question? I thought you 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 raised a hand there. I I wonder for the for the again for the cerebral protection dev devices because, um, you know, for some types of devices like deflector types, you also need to consider the anatomy of the arc. Uh, at least in 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 my experience, they are not perfect for every type of the arc. And, and sometimes, uh, you know, you, you do a lot of work simply to implant the device. So this is something that needs to be considered probably when screening with the CT. Well, I think what is important, um, you know, you're totally right, but um, 
even if you have a difficult anatomy that you're tackling, better to protect, um, even if it's not ideal. And let's not forget, there are many, many devices uh, in the pipeline that are waiting to be released in, in, in early clinical phases, which, um, which are very easy to be used with, you know, with, with less anatomical constraints. Once the, the, the way is cleared on how we do this, what is the indication in which patient population, I think then we have a bunch of devices coming out um, which will be easy to be used or even safer to be used and less complex than Sentinel, even though Sentinel is easy when you've used it. But you know, there are many, many others coming from the arm, protecting everything. So we'll see um, many more. And I think um, as we move along, there will be less anatomical restrictions with the newer devices. Okay, so well, I, I think, think that's that's nice. nice. um, maybe we should move on, move on to the next uh, session, the next half session. So mm -hmm. okay. um, we're gonna, uh, talk a little bit about uh, edge to edge uh, uh, repair. And our first speaker is uh, Becky Hahn, um, essentially talking about uh, echo essentials for interventionalist be uh, beginning mitral clip. Uh, Becky? This is just a, really a whirlwind uh, taking you through a case and uh, what we do uh, on a day-to-day -day basis uh, when we're uh, performing the mitral clip. These are my disclosures. The uh, guideline, the recent guidelines, as well as uh, this is a consensus document, have outlined some of the anatomic suitabilities for transcatheter mitral valve repair. And I, I won't go through those, but rather uh, focus on, again, this is for the beginner, the six steps to mitral clip deployment, um, which you see here. And one of the more important things to remember is that echo and fluoroscopy uh, are, are, are don't have a one-to-one -one relationship. The TEE view is actually 90 degree clockwise rotated from the fluoroscopic view. Again, because the, the transesophageal probe is obviously behind the heart um, and typically the uh, fluoroscopic imaging is, is uh, an anteroposterior. Now there are multiple different sites where you can perform the transeptal and all of these can be guided by echocardiography. Um, and this is just a beautiful review that was done showing again that the red circle area is, is where we typically want to do uh, the mitral clip device, which gives us enough, enough height above the uh, annulus and uh, allows you to orient the device right at the commissural line. Um, and we'll go over uh, some of the imaging that's required. So remember again that uh, this is uh, would be a fluoroscopic view, but the TEE probe is, is situated uh, behind uh, the heart. And therefore, the uh, first image that we will typically uh, look for is going to be the bicable view. And this bicable view, which you can see up and down the uh, superior and inferior vena cava, um, allows us to see the fossa. Um, the other view, and again, we want uh, three different views to define the exact point of the transeptal. Uh, the second view is typically short, the short axis aortic valve view, which allows us to see the anterior and posterior orientation of the transeptal puncture. And then finally, uh, the four chamber, and this is a slightly off axis four chamber in order to see the medial commissure and again, the fossa and the region of uh, the transeptal puncture. But in reality, what we do on a day-to-day -day basis now when we're doing the transeptal puncture is uh, look for 3D, uh, three-dimensional echo. And so from the bicable view, and again, this is, uh, would be the equivalent of an LAO view for uh, fluoroscopy, we'll see the uh, tricuspid and mitral valve on FOSS and really outline the uh, interatrial septum very, very well. And in the setting of being able to see the mitral valve and the commissure, we now can direct the interventionalist to the precise location of the transeptal puncture. So again, mitral valve uh, looking up at us, the uh, medial commissure is uh, near field, the lateral commissure is now uh, further away from us, and uh, the fossa you can see is the thin part of the interatrial septum. This is an example, obviously, of uh, biplane imaging, also a three-dimensional function, and uh, allows us to see two simultaneous planes. And we can change whether or not this is exactly 90 degrees or 60 degrees from uh, the primary imaging view, but it does allow us now to measure uh, the height above the annular plane, 
remembering that uh, in addition to biplane imaging, we will frequently use single plane imaging, which has very high resolution. After you've identified the transeptal puncture, and remember that that is probably the most important part of the procedure because uh, that will determine how easy it is uh, to direct the catheters into the precise location for the clip. But after we do the transeptal, we're advancing the clip system, clip delivery system, and then as the clip comes in, we wanna continuously uh, watch uh, the direction of the clip and uh, make sure that it is not uh, touching any of the uh, anatomic structures that are adjacent to it. Then when we position and orient the clip, we are heavily relying on three-dimensional imaging at this point. And whether or not you use a triplane mode as I showed here, or the newest modalities, which are the live 3D multiplanar reconstruction, uh, we rely on that to uh, allow us to see in three dimensions the orientation of the clip in relation to uh, the coaptation line. And you can see here that uh, uh, by just rotating the clip uh, we, and uh, then our plane, we can uh, continually watch uh, the clip arms as they're rotating um, into the correct position. Now we now have the G4, and so the G4 has independent grippers and that therefore the interventionalist must, must identify um, which is the tactile gripper line. And so this is just an example showing you the anterior gripper line um, being uh, released and you can see the uh, clip arm coming down and whether you do it on three-dimensional imaging or on two-dimensional imaging, uh, it really doesn't matter as long as you can see it well and you remember uh, which line is which. We then go ahead and advance the clip below the leaflets and uh, uh, when we do that, we still wanna maintain the orientation of the clip. And so again, heavily relying upon three-dimensional imaging because if you just gain out, we, we never go into transgastric views anymore. Uh, we just gain out until you drop out the leaflets and you can now see the clip arms. And uh, we uh, use currently three-dimensional live 3D uh, multiplanar reconstruction to uh, perform uh, the orientation below the leaflets. Now, when we're grabbing the leaflets, we really wanna image uh, the entire grasping procedure and make sure that we see the length of the leaflets being captured. And so here again is a, a live multiplanar reconstruction. Uh, we see the leaflets going in, the clip arms coming down, and then we see the interaction of the leaflets with the clip arms. And that also tells us that we have a good grasp. Well, uh, these are uh, the multiplanar reconstruction examples of positioning the clip. And so uh, using the uh, three-dimensional image to align the clip, watching the grasping of the leaflets, and then closing the clip uh, again on 3D or on, on color in order to uh, determine whether or not you've made an effect on the regurgitation. It's important to make sure you have a tissue bridge uh, and that that bridge is well-defined, uh, which helps you uh, understand how much leaflet has been uh, captured. There is an algorithm that uh, the company uh, that Abbott has recommended for optimizing the G4. Uh, we typically will recommend simultaneous grasping of the leaflets instead of single grasp in order to prevent a twisting of the, of the clip. But if there's any doubt at all in uh, the, the amount of leaflet within the clip arms, then we will optimize with single leaflet uh, grasping. After deployment, uh, the American Society of Echo has come up with an algorithm to uh, follow to determine the amount of regurgitation that's, uh, that you've left behind and therefore be able to decide whether or not a second clip is necessary. And that includes looking at the color Doppler jet, but also on the uh, other findings that should accompany an adequate reduction in mitral regurgitation, which is resumption of forward flow in the pulmonary veins, an increase in forward systolic stroke volume, and frequently we'll, we will see smoke uh, forming in the left atrium as the reduction in mitral regurgitation has occurred. So this is one of uh, the patients, uh, again, the final assessment. We will also, besides using co uh, 2D color Doppler, rely heavily on three-dimensional reconstruction with uh, planimetry of the 3D vena contracta area, and it, our cutoff for putting a second clip in 
is a VCA of 25 millimeters squared um, or more. And in that setting, we would go for a second clip. This particular patient had a normalization of forward flow, and that is associated with a good prognosis. And in addition, we wanna make sure that we have not created mitral stenosis by looking at the mean gradient and planimetering the residual orifices. Uh, again, aiming to maintain at least two centimeters squared uh, following the clip procedure. And then we do also uh, make a decision as to whether or not we need to close the iatrogenic atrial septal defect. Um, I, I would say 99% of the time we do not. But if a patient has a concomitant pulmonary hypertension and, uh, and or persistent right to left flow that causes desaturation during the observation period, then we may close. Uh, we've done that very, very rarely. And in, in summary, we now have a lot of other rendering modalities that have been able to help us uh, determine the, uh, the, both the baseline and the residual regurgitation. Um, and allows us to, again, make decisions about uh, proceeding with a second clip. So again, six steps that we've covered, transeptal, advancing the clip delivery system, positioning and orienting, positioning below the leaflets and grasping the leaflets, and the post-delivery assessment. All of them rely heavily on three-dimensional imaging. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Becky. Um, we'll come back to um, asking some questions at the end. Um, so our next lecturer is um, Samir Kapadia to talk about functional MR percutaneous treatment considerations. Uh, Samir. So first of all, thank you uh, for uh, the opportunity. And uh, what I want to talk about is that uh, when to treat functional mitral regurgitation with percutaneous therapies. So a very important thing to understand in the functional mitral regurgitation, of course, this is a very long topic. But the functional mitral regurgitation treatment is actually a heart failure management. So it is different than taking care of the patients with mitral regurgitation for primary mitral regurgitation, but this is patients with heart failure. So the treatment of underlying problems, including atrial fibrillation, conduction abnormality, coronary artery disease, and optimal guideline directed medical therapy is essential. And very simply, if after all these treatments, patients are symptomatic with severe mitral regurgitation, then percutaneous therapy is adequate. So what I'll try to cover for the FMR treatment consideration is that there are different types of FMR. What is the clinical significance of FMR? How severe is the FMR? And then the treatment options for FMR. What is the functional mitral regurgitation? So function of the mitral valve is not good. And what is the function of the mitral valve? So the mitral valve obviously has the leaflets, it has the annulus, uh, it has uh, the, uh, the papillary muscles and the cords. And when you have the functional mitral regurgitation, the, function, the structure of the mitral valve is normal, so-called normal, but the function, meaning the position of the mitral leaflets is not uh, adequate. Now, this happens from the annular dysfunction, annular dilatation, or restriction of the leaflets. Each of these three elements you have to understand and, and study, the leaflet can be restricted from the ventricle as well as from the atrium. So when you have atrial fibrillation or when you have dilated atrium, the posterior leaflet can be restricted because of the atrial enlargement. It can be restricted from the ventricular enlargement. Uh, it can be restricted because of the ventricular dysfunction, which is ge not generalized, but localized. The annular function has three important parts of annular function. So it has a folding motion, anterior posterior motion, and the translational motion. All of these three things can be affected in different parts of uh, mitral regurgitation, uh, functional mitral regurgitation. So a lot of people talk about FMR uh, due to ventricular uh, dysfunction, due to atrial dysfunction, but most commonly it is because of both atrial and ventricular dysfunction. So this is an important part to understand. So this is a very nice article by Dr. O'Gara saying that the primary secondary mitral regurgitation is a disease of left ventricle or left atrium. 
I think you can add to that to say that this is a disease of left ventricle and or left atrium and or mitral annulus without adequate compensatory changes in the mitral leaflet. Because now there's a lot of evidence to say, that's why I was saying that the leaflets are structurally normal. But when you have FMR, the leaflets actually elongate or should, you know, if you have dilated ventricle, uh, the leaflet should elongate. And if these compensatory changes are not happening, then also you can develop FMR. Clinical significance of FMR is an important thing to understand. So if you have so the, when you see a patient with MR, you look at three things. That how is this, how severe is the MR? How severe is the LA or L, uh, LV dysfunction? So this is why I put this three axis. So if you have a patient with severe MR, but LA and LV dysfunction is not that bad. And this is a good patient to treat mitral regurgitation because this is his problem. If you have a patient which has some LV, LA dysfunction, some LV dysfunction or mitral regurgitation is severe, then this patient can be potentially uh, treated with uh, treated for mitral regurgitation. But when you're talking about not as severe MR, but very severe LA and LV dysfunction, then you are talking about a problem. This is where I think this proportionate and disproportionate MR concept comes into play to say that there are patients who have uh, a significantly uh, uh, significant MR or not compared to LA and LV dysfunction. How severe is FMR? And I think uh, Dr. Becky Han just uh, presented all this data and uh, information. Again, there is a fair bit of information now available uh, to say that uh, how you grade FMR. Uh, but very important thing to understand that this is very load dependent. Uh, this is not an easy determination. So I think many times trying to understand the patient in different load conditions is an important measure to say that if this FMR is symptomatic or not. So judging the severity, in my opinion, is an art. It requires a proper history taking, understanding the anatomy, Doppler function, and then of course the LA, RA, and LV dilatation. And as I said, response to exercise or treatment. All of these things, if you put together, then you can, you can uh, determine the severity of FMR. And what are the treatment options? So, this is a this is a nice uh, 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 graph to say that all the treatments that are available for heart failure are very important treatment uh, for uh, uh, functional mitral regurgitation. If especially if you have reduced ejection fraction. So if you have preserved ejection fraction, none of this is true. But if you have a reduced ejection fraction, all of these treatments are very important, and so therefore should be considered as a first line treatment and surgical treatment is a class 2B indication uh, for this uh, FMR indication, especially if you have LV dysfunction. So I think that it is clear that if the medical treatment does not work, uh, it is very reasonable to consider transcatheter therapies. And there are several transcatheter therapies and there's no way in 10 minutes we can go through all of these things, but there is mitroclip or leaflet apposition, Pascal, indirect annuloplasty, spacer devices, plus leaflet technologies, TMVRs, and then direct uh, annuloplasty. So there are several different uh, methods uh, to treat this functional mitral regurgitation. And there's huge investment in this field. So you're likely to see uh, some benefits uh, in, and a lot of these different things are being tested in different stages of trials. Uh, currently in United States, the most important available option is actually mitroclip. And these days we use all four forms of mitroclip G4 is our standard mitroclip now available, where you can use different lengths of mitroclip, different widths of mitroclip, and independent grasping. Uh, and again, this is super important to recognize and how you select different clips, how you use it, all is a little bit of a of a art, and uh, some information is coming out. As we all know that these two trials have been published and there was a significant difference, but I think again, if you understand that the main difference is patient selection and how effective is the treatment, how carefully you can do this therapy, then you can understand that uh, how to select the patient and how to perform the procedure. I have one patient to show you to just highlight these uh, features. Uh, so this is a simple patient. It is nothing very complicated, but this is a 68 year old gentleman with coronary artery disease, uh, with stands in place, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, uh, paroxysmal AFib, CKD, mitral regurgitation, very typical patient for FMR. 
Again, if you see these patients, this is very important to recognize that most people do four chamber view and a uh, long axis view. Again, to see the width of the jet, transthoracic echo wise, it is good uh, to do a two chamber view so you can see the intercommissural view to understand that how broad is this jet. Uh, the 3D imaging is critical. So again, to try to understand each uh, P1, P2, and P3, uh, how deep are the scallops? Where exactly are the scallops? What is the anterior leaflet quality like? What is the posterior leaflet quality like? And then looking at the ventricular view is also very critical because you can see the pores, you can see how the leaflets are moving and which part of the leaflet you can oppose uh, that will uh, be more effective. So this is, a, this is a very important part to understand the details of the mitral valve, subvalvular as well as atrial side anatomy. Uh, there, are, there are different ways and different methods and uh, Dr. Han just uh, showed you a very elegant presentation. And again, to understand the leaflet uh, structure, nowadays you have uh, very different ways of looking at the leaflet with the 3D anatomy, uh, using a glass view, using uh, different kinds of lights uh, to understand that how the leaflet thickness are. Uh, it is also very important in my mind to do the MPR. Uh, so this is a multiplanar reconstruction. And again, what I try to do, and this is very important for the imaging uh, colleagues uh, to help us, is to put the green plane, and you can save this particular image and you can play with it. So the idea is that I usually ask them to save a good MPR, and then I can arrange my grasping plane and measure the posterior leaflet, anterior leaflet, decide that where you want to have a coaptation line. So how much of the leaflet you can grasp depending on the size of the clip, each leaflet and how the coaptation line will move forward or backwards and how the different scallops, if they're there on the side will open or not. You can judge all of these things uh, by a very careful uh, analysis uh, of the leaflets and of the FMR uh, matter. So in this particular patient, you would say that we would like to put there and then whether you want to put one or two clips See again, how broad is the jet, where you start, uh, how you will put one clip, how you'll align the second clip, very, very important. In this particular thing, we decided to put two uh, NT clips. Uh, and uh, as you can see, uh, we can place the clips very close to each other. The scallops will not open. And you can see ventricular side, atrial side, uh, that the uh, clips are well attached. Fluoroscopically, when you put the second clip, it's very important to place the clip very parallel and not at a canted view. So again, I use a biplane, so you can use a biplane to understand that how the, how the clips are going to align to each other, how far you want to put some, this is a little further than you can even come closer to this. So uh, this depends on what you think is the best way to place the clip. But again, these angles, uh, if they're parallel, there's better. If you're not, then you can cant the clips and make the MR worse between the clips. And sometimes that's difficult. Uh, to treat uh, if you have uh, a clip that is uh, canted and the leaflets are distorted. Again, when you analyze the results, it is very, very important to see both the ventricular view as well as the atrial view, because that helps you to decide whether you, where the jet is coming, because sometimes the jet splays and it looks like a live jet, uh, but actually uh, you can un understand that where exactly the jet is coming from, and this can help you uh, to place the clip properly or adjust the clip uh, accordingly. So uh, the take home message for this is to say that FMR is a complex disease that requires very careful evaluation, including the echo, clinical, and what exact therapies we are going to use. Appropriate patient and uh, therapy selection can potentially help to uh, not just uh, make people feel better, but even they can live longer. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, um, Samir. So um, we're gonna move on and hopefully have some time for discussion. So um, Saibul Carr is gonna talk about MitroClip G4. Uh, what are the, the differences? Um, Saibul? Thank you for inviting me. And it's a very nice session. Um, everyone's very relaxed. Even Rebecca has not fallen asleep yet. So we're going to talk about mitoclip G4 
Uh, there's been, of course, as you know, four generations of MitroClips, and actually uh, the G4 definitely has several advantages. As already spoken by the previous two speakers, the G4 has clearly uh, two it, four clip options with NT, NTW, XT, and XTW. It gives you the control grip actuation. That means you can grasp leaves independently. It simplified the procedure a little bit more. There's further precise control steering. In addition, you can measure lactator pressure. So I'm just going to show some of the features of the G4. So this is the G4 clip system. And you can see over here, you have the NT, which is four millimeters wide. And then you have the NTW, which is six millimeters wide. And then you have the XT, which is longer, slightly longer. And then you have the XTW. And if you look at the length, the length of the arm of the NT is nine millimeters. And the length of the XT is about 12 millimeters. And the span obviously increases when you enlarge the clip, which allows you to catch larger flares and so are difficult in Arabies. In addition to that, you can have, this is called the control grip actuation. And you can see over here, you have the grippers and the grippers you get, you're allowed to use, you can put the grippers simultaneously or you can grasp independently. And this was a feature which has allowed us to optimize leaflet insertion or treat them independently. So this is the future. And so I'm just going to start with the first patient in the world treated with a G4. She was a 77 year old lady of Jehovah's Witness and shortness of breath, renal dysfunction, mitral calcification. And you can see over here, you can see a single flail segment, a mitral orifice, which is reasonable and a lot of mitral anal calcification. So if before the G4, our plan would have been to just use one XT or X2 XTWs, but we thought in order to preserve orifice, we could just use one XTW because the leaflet length was adequate. So that was our plan. And then you can see over here, the X plane showing the leaflet grasping. The gap is not too much and the width is about 12 millimeters. Um, this is the MR jet eccentric. And so then you over here, we are positioning the clipper, we are making sure that we wanted to check which one is the independent gripper you can find out controlling. So we actually going to individually look at each of the grippers. Then once we knew which one is what, we advance the clip inside the ventricle. And then you can see you want to watch the leaflets grow, falling on the clip. And we did that. And once we knew that the, both the leaflets are captured, we went ahead and grasped the leaflets. Now, this is very important. That once you grasp the leaflet, you can see my clip is quite open. It's like almost 100, 120. And usually, as Rebecca said, once you grasp the leaflets, it's important not to close it, but to make sure that the orientation of clip is clearly perpendicular to the line of coaptation. So my plan is you should orient your clip above the clip above the leaflets, below the leaflets, and after grasping. And then once you've done that, only then you close the clip. This prevents distortion of the valve. And then you can see there with just one grasp, the MR is absolutely eliminated. And you can see the significant smoke in the left atrium and the LV function going down. So you can see here with just one XTW, you achieved trace micro regurgitation and the gradient was only one millimeter of mercury. This patient was the first patient treated in November of um, 2019, I think, and has since then been dying very well. Uh, this is an example of the double orifice valve with a nice posterior insertion and a gradient of only one. And that's the fluoroscopic images of the G4 showing the widened arms. Now, this is the first clip G4. The next case, I use the independent grip of function. And I want to show you an example is that we grasped the leaflets, but we weren't sure that one of the leaflets was proper. So we removed the gra uh, grasper from the posterior leaflet. And you can see that the posterior leaflet is rolled in. So we reposition by advancing the clip system, then positioning it. And now you can see the lift leaflet is resting much better. And then we dropped the grippers and caught the leaflets. And then you can see you get a, get a much, much better grasp and you get a single R, double orifice valve but a nice tissue bridge between the A2 and P2. So here's an example that we optimized using the independent leaflet grasping technique. 
This was, of course, the first case uh, in the world, and since then, uh, several thousands of cases have been done. Uh, this is just another patient with a flail P3, and in this patient, we prefer to use, because it's P3, we wanted to use a narrow clip because we didn't want to get caught on the cords, so we used over uh, here uh, two NT, NT clips and actually landed up getting a good result. You see, we prefer to use narrow clips in the sides because you don't want to be caught in the cords. You agree with that, Rebecca? And there we use the second one uh, over here, and we made sure that we grasped the leaflets quite well. And you can see here, you almost eliminated mitral regurgitation with that magic two clips that right in the corner and preserving the entire leaflet orifice. Um, so, and these are some of the features that I'd like to show you with you that the MitoClip G4, in addition to that, you can measure left atrial pressures through the guiding catheter, which you did not have in the previous generations of the MitoClip. Uh, we don't use that, of course, that system. We tend to use a pigtail catheter with the left atria um, in the left atrium separately and measure left atrial pressures in addition to G4. And I finally want to say that there are two studies starting using the G4. You have the uh, expand G4 registry, which is going to actually see the, uh, see the uh, actual data using the G4. And number two, the repair MR trial, which is actually going to randomize patients with moderate risk uh, surgical risk patients to mitoclip versus surgical repair. And we think with the advanced G4 system and better results and possibly more safety, it will be more comparable to contemporary surgical practices. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Saibal. Um, so um, maybe we can have uh, our panels uh, screen back and, and anyone have questions for Becky, for Samir, or for um, Saibal. Um, please go ahead. Hi, uh, Dr. Carr. Uh, yes. One of our presentation. Uh, may I have a qu short questions about, do you have experience, any experience to compare the PASCO oh. with the, well, what, what is the difference? With the Pascal versus the MitoClip? Yes. Um, obviously, I'm not going to make any st uh, statements, strong statements, because I've fallen into trouble for doing so. Uh, but I'm just going to tell you there's actually a randomized study uh, called Class 2D and 2F, which is randomizing patients with versus MitoClip versus the Pascal. The Pascal definitely has uh, additional fe just features. It's a wider arm. It has, uh, it's slightly longer and it has independent gripper functions. So it is actually very good. I've had a good, I've had a good experience with it in DMR. In FMR, I feel sometimes a bit challenged with the FMR cases, but DMR definitely it's very good. So I think at the present moment, it's reasonably comparable, but the trial will probably shed more light as to which is better than the other. Okay, okay thank you. So uh, for in your practice, what is the most common reason for rejecting patient? Is it anatomy or uh, clinics? If anatomy, which features of the valve make you reject the patient? Yeah, this is a very good uh, uh, question, actually. I think the, the most important for me is mitral valve orifice. If the mitral valve orifice is less than uh, 3.5 square centimeters, especially I think in Asian people, that's probably the one most important. The second one, uh, which is, I, I think which we don't see that in common, is if the leaflets are very calcified. Like if you have leaflets, the annulus and the leaflets very calcified, then doing this procedure doesn't really work. Because if you do it, you, you've got severe stenosis. Uh, these are the two commonest. And then of course, there's some every uh, other ones, like for example, multiple prolapsing segments. Um, you know, <coughs> mitral calcification is not, a risk, not an issue usually for me. Uh, or if it's to a very large segment of area of malcoaptation, then I think it's an exclusion. At, at Columbia, and then rheumatic heart disease. Another thing, I'm sorry, it's not common in the U.S., but rheumatic heart disease, and for that matter, in Trika, in you know, Rebecca has seen a lot of cases of Trika. Rheumatic heart disease, are, even if it's pure MR, is not good because usually they have commercial fusion, and so those are exclusions. Yeah, I, um, just the extra comment about uh, the valve size, uh, uh, the orifice um, at baseline. We usually look at the patient's body size. 
Um, and again, this is not anything that's been proven or, you know, uh, in any way, but we'll use the cutoff for prosthesis patient mismatch that, uh, for mitral stenosis, for mitral valves that was generated by Raham Tula many, many years ago. And so the cutoff is one, there are two different studies. One showed 1.1, the other 1.2 centimeter squared per meter squared. So when we have a really small patient, so in the Asian population, I mean, the BSA of 1.5, 1.6, then we can actually go down to 3.8 to 3.5 because we know that a single clip will typically reduce the valve area by about 40%, 40 to 50%, depending on how many clips. And so then you just back, back calculate and determine whether or not you think you can get one clip on. But I think a uh, very good, good point, but also sometimes the leaflet length is also important. So some posterior leaflet sometimes is very small. So that's an issue. And the shape of the annulus is also important when you have a small orifice. So if the annulus is stretched, uh, then you create a, 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 this kind of a uh, clip versus if it is not so stretched, then you have a larger orifice. So how much restricted is the anterior leaflet opening is also very crucial in trying to determine whether you're going to have mitral stenosis at the end. So it is not just the area, but also the shape and the leaflet motion. Both of these are critically important. So this is a little bit of an art than just pure science uh, to say that when the clip will work or not. Yeah, that, that's really important because the 40 to 50% reduction in valve area with a single or double clip uh, comes from the early Everest trial, which was primarily degenerative. And so to Samir's point, once you have functional, you may actually reduce the valve area more with a single clip. The uh, other uh, thing uh, that uh, I use, I said, I use re uh, real-time left atrial pressures. And to me, a, a mean reduction of LA pressure or a mean reduction of the V wave is very important. And, and I say real-time because you can't say like after, because sometimes the blood pressure goes up. And if the left atrial pressure does not change, either the V wave doesn't change or the, or the mean pressure goes up, I don't deploy that clip because I know I'm not helping the patient. Because what the patient sees is not the clip or the valve. What the patient sees is the left atrial pressure. And, uh, and the me, me have a question. Uh, I have a question for Saiban and Samir. Uh, is, you know, of course, you know, uh, edge to edge repair works, but it does make the leaflet excursion less on both sides. So what do you predict the durability of this in terms of trials have been done in high risk patients with probably limited life expectancy, uh, but where is this going? As we use wider clips, many clips, et cetera. I, I, find, I personally find the durability as the least problematic part of this okay. uh, therapy, uh, because I think that it works tremendously well, amazingly well, to be honest with you, because I just saw a patient nine years uh, out uh, in a COEP trial. And uh, the reason why I saw her back was because she was having dilated, uh, you know, her, she has dilated cardiomyopathy. But the size of the orifice, the scarring of the leaflet, the leaflet were not, to be honest with you, not that much different than what we started. I have seen a couple of patients where they where you have mitral stenosis that was somewhat unexpected with valvulitis kind of patients. But uh, as long as the patient does not have leaflet pathology, and that's why uh, I think is, again, something to be studied, uh, the long-term durability is not a real challenge uh, in at least my mind. Uh, for degenerative MR, you do see new MR develop elsewhere because you know, the pathology uh, keeps changing and expanding and getting worse. But for functional MR, this has not been a challenge. Now, of course, the data also uh, supports that. Uh, so uh, that's my stand. So Vinny, uh, uh, I, my longest follow-up for a clip surviving is 2005, November for second. She was 25 years old and now she's, I think, 36 or something like that. And she has mild TR, MR and she does Pilates three times a week. Now that's a few cases. Now in the Everest two, most of, most of my patients were low risk patients, right? 
because they were randomizable to surgery. And the surviving patients are actually doing, interestingly, as Sami said, they haven't developed progressive mitral stenosis. They, and the only ones that I've seen progressive mitral stenosis are patients who are, who are chronic renal failure patients, where they develop uh, annular calcification and leaflet calcification. Those you have to be a little careful about. But otherwise, uh, somehow, it seems to be uh, quite, it's stabilized and stays, the scar doesn't actually progress that much. This is very interesting. And the reason I ask is, as you know, that there is a cutting edge registry. And we were really surprised that then as the CLIP approval has taken place, uh, the expansion, the rapid expansion, I would say, has led to more failures than we expected. And I think this is something probably more to do with you know, selection education, cases. training, proper selection, uh, etc. So that was that's why the question. Now, very important uh, question. I think the result of the clip is extremely variable. I have now so many patients referred for redo clips. So, like you know, they say that we put a clip and now there's MR. It's not that it, the MR came back. If the MR was never treated properly. So. This is, a bit, this is a serious challenge in my mind, in the uh, community, that uh, when, when people get inadequate result, and then they say that the, the results are worse now than it was before. But it, if you look at carefully, you can tell that they were never perfect to begin with. Uh, Danny, you have a question. Yeah, thank you. So we have so many candidates coming with much of good, good, good decision and uh, many of them are uh, suboptimal, right? Some of them have uh, short posterior leaflets, some of them have commissural leaks, and many of them are optimal, but many others are suboptimal. And when we talk about a relatively safe procedure and the retrievable device, why shouldn't we try more often in those suboptimal uh, anatomical patients. What do you think about that? To try, if it looks good, you keep it. If you don't, you take it out. Does it cost $35,000? That's one thing. The other thing is you shouldn't do a procedure which is not going to work. And there's a, there's a saying in my center, we call it as, it's not tri-clip, T-R-Y clip. I think patient selection is very important if there are other options. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I think anything in life is like that, right? You are to see the rest. No comments, Vinny. <laughs> yeah, and you don't want to plan for a failure, but you're right. I, I'm in favor of Danny anyway, so it's okay. We do, we do try. Let's put it like that. So yes, that, we do. If there are no other options, of course, we are going to try. Um, so, Samir, follow up with your question about uh, degenerative MR, right? So, you know, it, it, it seems like the procedure could be pretty straightforward, but as you know, many of these valves are not, not normal, meaning they have rupture cords, they have thin leaflets, and you're now adding some weight to it, especially some of these patients we see was done outside with two clips on with a very fragile valve. And next thing you know, they throw off easily a single leg, uh, a leg detachment and, you know, another, another cord throw off. So are there features that you would not do degenerative uh, and maybe Becky too as well from Echo. It's like, you know, this is kind of crazy that this is, uh, you know, the valve is too fragile uh, it, to sort of really clip them. And, and, you know, many patients end up going to surgery anyway at the end, because even though they were high risk, they could actually be repaired. And we've seen a few of these patients from outside that uh, the valve just get worse and worse from, 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 uh, you know, uh, bearing the weight of the clip with the fragile, um, you know, leaflet and cords. So I think you are right that the uh, if the width of the uh, flail segment is very long, and if it involves multiple uh, scallops, uh, then I think that you will create more tension uh, on the uh, on the valve. And both if the anterior and posterior leaflet the cords are ruptured, that also tells you something uh, that uh, this valve is and the, the thinness of the leaflets. Uh, can also again, at least in our our places, you know, most of the time these are 80, 90 year old patients, 90 plus year old patients. When you are talking about this kind of valves, and nobody wants to really operate on them as a primary patient, so we would definitely try, as you said, that sometimes we end up with surgery. Uh, but again, they will be better candidates for surgery uh, because we have uh, we have corrected their 
their problem of cardiogenic shock or whatever they are uh, struggling with. So I have not said no for that particular reason. Uh, if it is really wide and the patient is a good surgical candidate, then obviously we send them to surgery. Becky, any thoughts from imaging standpoint? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that we've, we've done another, a number of patients in cardiogenic shock and uh, one comes to mind where, uh, you know, again, it, it was kind of a Hail Mary, you know, and we didn't think we were going to get a great result. And we got a great result and the patient refused to go to surgery um, afterwards. And so it's just, I think with the options that we now have with G4, uh, there are lots of uh, nuances to, to being able to get these really, really big gaps. Um, and I think the, the main um, contraindication right now for us is bad imaging. Um, and so if you can't see what you're doing, then even if it's an ideal P2 flail, we're just not going to be able to get, to get a clip on. And so um, I do think that the, uh, you know, the, the not doable cases are fewer and fewer uh, as imaging has gotten better and better. So Becky, one question for you that when your imaging is bad, do you turn the table and see, uh, or turn the page, patient turning is also possible, but this day is sometimes when this is terrible imaging in people with very tortuous uh, esophagus, I have been able to turn the table, like mm. tilt it, and it works uh, sometimes. I agree with it. Though. I've done that some here. Yeah, we, we, and we also do, um, you know, a shoulder roll. So yes, um, yes. All, you, all you really have to do is, you know, because most of the time we've already imaged them, they, we thought they were fine. And then we brought them to the table and they're laying flat in there and we, and we can't yes. image. So we just do a right shoulder roll. Uh, yeah. Really helps a lot. Mm -hmm. And Inche from Germany, he actually does it routinely in all his cases. Yeah. He puts a shoulder roll on the right side. Yeah. So uh, Dr. Park, you want to uh, ask oh, questions oh. and maybe conclude the session? Okay, we uh, just started a micro clip procedure. Mm -hmm. So maybe Do Yong Gang, so do you have any comment on oh, yeah. question there? I have a small question to Dr. Ha uh, that I became to understand my echo colleague much better now with your excellent lecture. I have two small questions that uh, first, what do you consider for safe deployment after clip resting, the echo criteria? And second, uh, what is the optimal anti thrombotic strategy? After my okay. Um, so uh, I think the first question uh, was was uh, after deployment. Um, is that right? What um, the criteria that we we use? I may have gotten the question wrong, but you know the 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 newest um, guideline that's just been put out by the ASE gives us these criteria um, both for the tricuspid clip and the mitral clip on how to make decisions um, about uh, moving forward. And um, I, think, I think they're, they're, you know, they're, they're pretty good. Um, and so uh, as, as I think I showed, there, there are just a number of different things we're looking for that, that Seibel showed and, and Samir showed as well. You know, we, we love it when we see smoke starting to form in the atria. Uh, we love it when the pulmonary veins begin to have systolic flow again. Um, and so all, there are a number of different things that we can look look for obviously to to know that we have success and then uh, what was the second question well, anti-thrombotic therapy uh so we don't require anti so this is a really good point because um our options now for mitral and tricuspid valve are clip versus a replacement device and one of the decisions that we end up making is that if the patient cannot get anticoagulation um then we opt for clip um, I don't know if everyone else does that, but uh, for, on the tricuspid side, for sure, if you cannot get, we really want to anticoagulate our replacement devices. Um, but if we can't, then um, we opt for CLIP. So Dr. Jung, there is no standard. I mean, giving aspirin for six months is empiric, and I have in my whole career never seen a thrombus on a mitral device. Yeah. A vegetation so, I've seen, but not a yes, thrombus. Yes, rare, rare, but not a thrombus. So it's yeah, even well, if think, you do, aspirin is given empirically for six months, but I don't even think that's necessary. Yeah, I I give it only one month. Uh, uh, you know, if they have a problem, but uh, the question is that whether if of course if there be atrial fibrillation, 
then you've got to give them anticoagulation because several right. of these patients have anticoagulation. Okay, so uh, maybe one last question from uh, Denny. I think you want to ask about the burning bridges. So uh, a quick question and then we'll close. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's really following what we talked about uh, very briefly about the durability of these procedures, whether it's an uh, important concept or not with mitral clip procedures. But do you think burning the bridges or having it complex to do TMVR after mitral clip, we can tear the clip from the leaflet. We have the tools to do that nowadays. But uh, do you think this is an issue? Burning bridges to TMBR. Well, right I mean, I think that's something we think about. But remember, we also have annular, annular devices. Um, and it's possible, and many people have done this already, combining a, a, the, the coaptation device with an annular device. So I don't think we've completely burned the bridges. But as you say, there are now uh, Abbott's even trying to devise, devise uh, various tools to cut the clip out. Or one edge of it. Just last one then. Last one, quick one, okay? Yeah, well, I'm looking at Saiba, looking at Becky, I'm looking at Samir and listening to all these wonderful images and <clears throat> now fourth generation with various ways of using the clip. Um, and, you know, I think what we have to Keep in mind what Samir said. If you do an inappropriate clip, or if you don't have much experience, and let's be honest, the average operator has an even idea, not the slightest idea, what mitral valves look like, much less about the tricuspid. And now we're talking about fourth generation independent arms, one six, one four. You know, it's getting very, very complex. My fear is since the device is so safe, that more people are willing to use it and then we have something what Samir looked at or described just uh, just a minute ago that you have not treated the mitral insufficiency the appropriate way and then you burn the bridges and now it is kind of paradox that you implement a technology but at the same time you implement something to take it out again so that's very new in medicine um, uh, and we have to keep that Somehow in mind, I know, uh, you know, some um, Saibal is scratching his head because we have been arguing about this for the last 25 years, um, you know, whether it does something or not. But I think it has to be taken into consideration. Things are getting very, very, very complex by imaging, by technology. Let's talk about average operators. And if he does something, <clears throat> implements a bridge that's there. And then you have to look for Abbott or somebody else that takes the bridge out again in order to move on. And as far as combo procedures are concerned, yes, in theory, we have annular devices, but none of them work well. So um, I, I would be a little bit more careful with all enthusiasm that we can see with dedicated operators. <clears throat> we have to take into consideration that this is a definitive treatment, uh, at least for the next couple of years. Great, thank you, Eberhard. I think it's really important to point out that you know patient selection is still the most important for any procedures because you, some of the procedures are so safe and so uh, you know so fast now, but doesn't mean that you need you should do it right. Otherwise, you know you, you're just creating one problem after the other. So thank you everyone for this ses wonderful session. Uh, I know that we didn't get a chance to be able to discuss by cuspid valve with uh, Raj, but I'm sure his lecture. Um, will be you know, magnificent and will answer all the questions from his lectures anyway. So thank you so much. And hopefully we will be able to see you in real person sometime, somewhere, some, <laughs> you know, some in the future. <laughs> so um, be you. safe and um, very, very nice to see you all on Zoom. Okay. Thank you. Great, all right. Thank you, thank you for Bye. joining us. Thank Great. you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.